Thank you for joining. Let's get started. My name is Nitin Chabla, Product Manager for Shukla Medical. I would like to welcome all of you to the first of many sales training summer camp webinars. The focus of these will be clinical challenges with vision surgeries and how Shukla Medical's universal instrumentation can help improve the outcomes. Dr. Jeremy Gilliland will be our presenter today. He's a renowned orthopedic surgeon who specializes in adult reconstructive orthopedic surgery of the hip and knee. He performs routine and complex primary and revision joint replacement operations. His focus includes partial knee replacement and direct anterior total hip orthoplasty. Prior to his medical education, Dr. Gilliland studied mechanical engineering at California Polytechnic State University. His engineering background led him to the field of orthopedic surgery and more specifically into the specialty of total joint orthoplasty. He is now an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at University of Utah and enjoys training residents and fellows in adult reconstruction. Today, he will be sharing his hip and knee case studies and how Shukla Medical's universal instrumentation makes a difference in his OR. I would like to thank Dr. Gillen for taking the time out of his busy schedule and putting this presentation together. Dr. Gillen, please take it away. All right. Well, I don't know how renowned I am, but uh, I am uh, an orthopedic <laughs> surgeon who's done a fair amount of revision work, and uh, uh, been, it's been a pleasure to use uh, Shukla's equipment and to be a part of um, uh, the team at Shukla in the last year or so. And so it's my pleasure to be here to just to, to help out and um, you know give you all a little bit of of, of guidance and information. Um, and so we'll just jump right in. I think, Nitin, we're going to open up uh, questions in the last 30 minutes. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Please hold the questions okay, for great. later. We've got a, a long presentation to, to cover. Please, Dr. Lee, go ahead. All right, great. So we'll start with this slide here. It's probably a little blurry, but this is from a 2007 paper by, by Kurtz, and it was a projection of, of where we're headed with total knee and total hip arthroplasty, as well as revision total hip and total knee arthroplasty. Um, uh, from 2007 onward to 2030, and obviously it's a projection, but you can see that this is revision hip and knee replacement, uh, and you can see that these numbers are going to increase significantly. And several um, papers have looked at this and shown that we're probably following this trend uh, fairly accurately, um, at least on a, a somewhat of a linear scale. It may not be quite as exponential, but the numbers are increasing. They're going to continue to increase. And the point is we need equipment um, such as that provided by Shukla to help us in the revision setting to get our implants out. And so with that, we'll start into kind of hip revision um, concepts and then uh, jump into knee revision and open it up to some questions. And so with hip revision, I think if we're going to talk about hip revision, we need to understand the reasons for hip revision. And so if we look at the literature, um, this is a study on 2013 looking at early revisions and uh, in Medicare patients and really looking at revisions in the first 12 months after total hip replacement. You can see the risk factors for those early revisions. But if you look at the cumulative incidents and the reasons for revision in that first year, 44% um, were unspecified mechanical complications. But then the next major reasons, are, uh, re reasons for revisions are dislocation, infection, and periprosthetic fracture. I'll tell you that that unspecified mechanical complication is just coding error. It probably indicates dislocation or periprosthetic fracture. And so you can see dislocation is playing probably the largest role um, in, in our early revision rates um, after, after total hip arthroplasty. And with dislocation comes the need for revision and often comes the need for a revision of the femoral component. Um, if we, let's see if I can get back on this. There we go. And then this next paper looks at revision rates or reasons for revision in the first five years after total hip arthroplasty. You can see the instability still holds uh, the number one uh, role or, or, or reason for revision. And again, with instability, you have parts that are generally well fixed. And if there's any issues on the femoral side that need to be addressed, well, those need to come out. And so you have a well fixed stem that's likely going to need to come out. You can see infection is also playing a significant role. And with infection, you usually have well fixed parts, and unfortunately, an infected joint. Um, this looks at the Medicare population. It's looking at the rates of revision. You can see risk of revision about 2% in the first 18 months and then about 1% per year after that. And as we do more and more joints, you can see that we are going to continue to do more and more revisions. And if you look at revision joints or revision hip replacements and why are the revisions failing, 
Well, again, if you look at this table two at the bottom of, of this uh, of this slide here, it shows that the reasons for failure requiring a second revision, you can see instability still sits at the top of that list. And so again, in, in a case of instability, oftentimes the femoral component may need to be revised and it's often well fixed in that, in that setting. Um, again, infection playing another big role here. And, and with infection, you likely have well fixed parts unless it's been a raging infection or it was infected from the get-go. With aseptic loosening and significant osteolysis, you may have looser parts that don't require quite as much work to get out. So you can see in these, in, with instability and with infection, you have a lot of hips that need to be revised with well-fixed parts and it's gonna be a bit of a challenge to get them out. So as we prepare for revision total hips, um, this is guided some, somewhat to surgeons, but I think it's great for reps to understand this and to help their surgeons out. I think pre-op planning is essential. Um, you gotta have adequate x-rays, and, and I, I like to have serial x-rays to look at comparison over time to know what's been going on with that joint. I like to be able to template those x-rays if possible. And it's really imperative to have implant stickers from the prior su surgery or at least an op note to know what the parts are uh, and to, to know what you're gonna be facing in the OR. And the surgeon ought to have plan A, B, and C ready to go for the revision because in the revision setting, things don't always go as planned. But I think in terms of getting parts out, it's nice to also have an A, B, and C in terms of, you know, options to remove implants. And so that's where I think as a, as a Shukla rep, you can really be there to help out. And if you understand the implants that are in and understand, uh, you know, how uh, they may be difficult to come out, you can help that surgeon by giving them some, some interesting options for getting parts out. The question the surgeon has to answer is, why did this hip fail? And pain is not a good answer. Uh, they're thinking about what exposure they need to use, what the components are, how do I get the parts out, and then how can I get uh, fixation, which implants to use, and what bone defects to treat. But again, as the Shukla rep in the situation, understanding what the implant is and how to help get it out can be a huge help to the surgeon um, and, and really kind of make their day a lot easier. You can get those parts out quickly and expeditiously, and if they come in prepared with that, that equipment, it's, it's quite helpful. And obviously the surgeon does not want to be fooled in the OR um, and be caught with their pants down. And so when it comes to exposure options, the revision setting, um, uh, oftentimes we talk about osteotomies. And uh, in terms of osteotomies, you can see here on the femoral side, there's really three types of osteotomies you can do. Um, there's also variations of each of these, but the trochanteric osteotomy is really taking the troch off. We hardly ever use this. It's often done unintentionally but it's not something we want to do because when you, you take the troch off, it's not a digastric sleeve and then it's just attached to the abductors and not to vastus lateralis. And that tends to lead to a troch that wants to migrate up and away, it tends to lead to a limp and it's very difficult to fix. And so we'll either try for a trochanteric slide type osteotomy where you leave a digastric fragment, meaning the abductors and the vastus lateralis are still attached to that bony fragment and move that out of the way to get access, but more, Commonly, we're doing some sort of variation on an extended trochanteric osteotomy to come down, cut the side of the femur off. Usually, it's the lateral one third of the femur, including the troch, get that off, get access to the stem, chip out the stem, and then pop it out. Um, and so, when it comes to taking parts out, it's always great to know what those parts are. And I would encourage you, if you if you um, have access to or can get this book, it's really helpful. And if you're a rep that's got this book around and knows it uh, cold, you're going to be quite helpful to your surgeons, and they're going to call on you for help, and then obviously call on you for uh, the equipment that you can provide them. But this is a, a book. I wish that this gentleman had. He's a, a surgeon that published this book on uh, femoral components. He talked about publishing the same book for ass tablet components as well as knee components, but I think he ran out of steam after this book. Unfortunately, he did, but this, this is a great book. You can order it um, online, and uh, it's I use it all the time. If you have an implant uh, and you're not sure what it is, you can flip through this book and understand what the implant is, how it's fixed, and, uh, and really get a better idea of how to take it out. But really, when it comes to implant extract, extraction, the key is to get things out um, without damaging bone and often that involves just some patience. And so when it comes to the Shukla set, um, what are the things that I use routinely? Well, the hip stem extractor here is obviously the workhorse of this set. This is, uh, for me, 
um, uh, extraordinarily important. This is what I use almost every single hip revision case, regardless, it's going to be hard to take out. And, and I was telling Nitin earlier today that I, I don't even rely on any of the implant manufacturers' um, uh, removal equipment. I just rely straight or go straight to the shoe clip set because this extractor is so easy to use. For Wagner or, or modular style stems, I do use these um, uh, extension threaded tips hooked up to the shaft driver that then you can hook up to the C-frame. Um, and then obviously you use the C-frame and the big mallet. Only rarely do we use this head puller, um, but it can come in handy on occasion. And rarely do I use this hook extractor or the monoblock extractor um, because I think that the hip stem, hip stem extractor works so well. Obviously, this is how it's hooked up. You guys know this. Um, this is uh, really what's uh, put Shukla on the map is this C-frame and the hip stem extractor. Um, and uh, it's quite useful. And the head puller uh, can be nice, can help you pull off a head if it's cold welded, but usually you can just take a head impactor and pop the head off and move on to getting the stem out. For modular hips, this set is great. I've used it, and I think it can be quite helpful. Oftentimes the rep from that company will come in with their own extraction equipment, and those can be helpful to get the stem or the neck out. Um, but if, if uh, you know, if all else fails, this, this is a, a quite use, useful tool for those uh, very specific situations of a modular neck stem. So now we'll jump into a few hip case examples, and then we'll move on to knee revision and my thoughts there. But for hip case examples, this is a, the first case. It's a 66-year-old male. He actually presented to one of my spine partners in clinic um, looking quite, quite sick, but complaining of what he thought was low back pain. Uh, when he was in clinic, he was uh, pale and cool, and he was um, uh, actually febrile, and he was, he was really looking quite ill. And so my, my spine partner um, uh, really looked into him and, and found that his pain was really coming from his hip, sent him to the ER, where his hips were aspirated, and he was found to have bilateral MRSA infection. In the setting of what were um, prior well-fixed uh, depew curi stems, with pinnacle modular metal-on-metal -metal, uh, articulations. And these are metal-on-metal -metal articulations because you can't see the interface between the ball and the cup. You know it's a hard-on-hard -hard bearing. And when you can't see that interface, usually it involves a metal-on-metal -metal, um, cup. And if you look closely at the cup, you can see these little detents right here. Well, these are the anti-rotation tabs within the cup. It tells you that this is not a monoblock shell. It was likely a modular shell with a liner that could be impacted in. And so these are... Um, uh, again, pinnacle metal on metal uh, articulations with uh, well fixed curi stems. And with that comes um, the uh, unfortunate uh, situation of a patient who has metallosis and pseudotumors, and unfortunately now he's super infected. And so in the ER, we got serum cobalt um, and serum chromium levels, which were quite elevated, and we had bilateral MRIs obtained, and he had huge pseudotumors that actually filled up the thigh, his entire thigh down to his knee on the left side and uh, had taken out most of the abductors on the right side. And now he does it both full of MRSA and full of pus. So this guy was quite sick. He was admitted to our ICU um, and, uh, and I was called to, to deal with him. And so when we look at his situation, we gotta think about how do we get these parts out? And if we look closely at these films, there's a really tight interface between his stem and the cancellous bone don't see any real evidence of loosening. You do see this little bit of a radiolucent area here along the lateral shoulder and, and some right here. You also see this little area of excavation underneath the calca or underneath the collar. This we call rat bite osteolysis. And when we see this, especially in setting of a metal on metal bearing, this is often indicative of osteonecrosis from the metallosis occurring or the pseudotumor occurring. And so this tells me that he's probably got some metallosis, but the fact that I see no radiolucent lines along the implant bone interface here tells me that this is a well-fixed part. It's going to be really tough to get out. And then you got to know a lot about this stem and understand how it works. And the way that this stem is, and the reason I bring this case up is because you're going to see more and more of these stems that are going to need to be revised because they're used quite commonly. This is a fully HA-coated stem, the depew curi stem, which is what this is. Um, was really the, uh, the predecessor to the, this, this class of stems. And now nearly every major company has seen here uh, has a variety of this stem. But it's a stem that's designed to not wedge its way in. It compacts the cancellous bone. And it's supposed to be a little bit small looking on x-ray as it compacts that bone and it, 
it gets wedged into the cancellus bone, not out to the cortex level. But with that bony compaction and with all this HA coating, the entirety of the length of the stem, these things grow on quite well, and you get bony on growth the entirety of the length of the stem. The problem there is obviously getting the thing out can be quite challenging. And so it's really key to know that these things grow on the entirety of the length of the stem, and, it's, and it can usually involve the need for an ETO or an extended stroke enteric osteotomy to get these out. The other thing is most of these stems have a collar like this one, um, and that is because they're not designed to wedge in. What the French who designed this stem found is that you needed some sort of collar up top to give you some initial stability to avoid subsidence and, and give you some rotational control while the thing grew in. And uh, we found that the collar gives you better results in terms of these things not loosening up early on. Um, but when it comes to taking them out, the collar blocks the ability for you to get an osteotome down here. And so in rare occasions, I'll cut the collar off with a metal cutting burr if I really don't want to do an ETO, work osteotomes around the stem, work some K wires or drill bits down the stem, and then try to take it out through the top. But that usually requires you know, 45 minutes of work, and uh, oftentimes we're just not that patient or don't have the time, especially in a guy like this where he's got bilateral hips that we have to deal with. And so in him, he got bilateral extensive stroke enteric osteotomy. We were able to chip the stems out, and then using the hip extractor and the C-frame and the big mallet, we were able to whack them out. But I still had to use this despite doing an ETO and chipping most of the HA coating off. It still took quite a bit of effort to get this stem out, even when you thought you had taken most of the on-growth surface away. And so the, the shukla still came in handy and it's still necessary for this. This is another example of this very stem. This lady came in again with a metal on metal bearing. This is a Depew ASR cup. So it's a large head, non-modular cup, meaning it's a one-piece cup, doesn't have a liner that gets impacted into it. And um, this cup shows some evidence of possible loosening with radiolucency. She has a large pseudotumor on MRI. And you can see here in, in, in her situation, the stem looks loose up top. There's a radiolucency here. It's a radiolucent line along here. It looks like the stem has probably been wobbling up here. But it looks nice and tight down here. And you can see that this surgeon didn't use a collar. And so what he did is wedge this stem in pretty tight, following more of kind of a wedge stem philosophy without the use of collar. But what happened then is it's a titanium stem and most of its wedge occurred here. And then you got some wobbling up top before the thing grew in. And it, because there was no collar, this got loose up top but grew in well down here. And the, the, what often I hear surgeons say is, oh, that looks loose, it's gonna come out easily. But the reality is this stem is not gonna come out. And in her case, I, as you can see here, I had to do an ETO again uh, down to about this level of the stem get that femur apart, chip this thing out, work this whole interface down here, and then still use the shukla to, to whack the thing out. Um, so that's it's a good thing to know. It's a good thing if you get into a case and the surgeon says, oh, yeah, it's going to be a loose cry, it's going to be easy, you ought to just sort of maybe hint at them that that may not be the case. Um, this is a, a second case example. So this is a 48-year-old female. She actually came in recently to see me. She had her first hip um, done back in, in May of 2017. Unfortunately, that had instability, which again, we talked about being one of the major causes of revision, and that was revised um, uh, in October. She then unfortunately developed an infection after that instability revision, and uh, she had um, a stage one spacer placed, and then an antibiotic course, and then had her stage two revision done in January of this year. And unfortunately, she developed a draining wound and persistent infection and showed up in my clinic uh, reinfected. And so she presents to me like this, she's 48, she now had like five hip surgeries. And unfortunately she now has a long fluted tapered modular stem that looks well fixed in a setting of what you can see was a prior extended stroke and dark osteotomy to get her first primary stem out. And this is, a, this is a bad problem because when this stem grows in well, it grows in like a banshee and uh, Getting them out can require an extended stroke and teric osteotomy, sometimes down to the tip of the stem, and a lot of chipping and a lot of swear work before the thing finally comes out. So this is this type of stem is a, again a fluted, tapered, modular revision stem. These stems have become the workhorse for us in revision surgery. They've really taken over as the gold standard revision stem. It's really what what you're seeing put in um, almost routinely in most revision cases. 
Most of the companies have a form of this stem. Here's sort of the major players in the market right now in the U.S. and, and the names of those stems. The names aren't really what matter, though. It's just that this is how these stems work. It's based on a Wagner-style stem that uh, Dr. Wagner from Germany developed way back in, in, I think, the 50s or 60s. It was a monoblock stem then, and it's based on the philosophy of a, of a um, conical base reamer. So you ream a cone in the bone. You actually ream into the cortex, and you ream with a conical-shaped reamer that matches the taper of this stem. And then the stem has these anti-rotational flutes that dig into the cortex to give you rotational stability. And you wedge this thing down into the cone ream that you have that gives you axial stability with that conical match. And they have usually a grit blasting on them and they get sort of an on growth, but they wedge in so tight initially and they have such great stability initially that that on growth happens pretty aggressively and they're very, very difficult to take out. Matched on top of that now, most of these are now modular. The original Wagner stem uh, out of Germany was non-modular, which made it very difficult to deal with in terms of getting the stem to sit right. And so now we have modularity with, with proximal bodies that give you offset and length control, and you can obviously get rotation for versional control. So getting the body apart is usually not the hard part, although some stems like the Zimmer ZMR can be hard. When you try to get the body apart, Usually, you involve getting the company's specific more staper breaker that you can use like a flywheel puller to pop the body off, but then getting the distal stem out is what's difficult. And that's where you can use these extractor tips and the shaft driver to hook up to the C frame. These all come in a variety of threads that you can thread into this, and then you can say a prayer and hit really hard. But if the stem is stuck, it's often going to need a large osteotomy. In this case, I was really lucky. We were able to hook up with the C frame. And uh, my fellow was able to give it some good blows, and her stem came out, and there was a party on the back table. I mean, I was literally dancing around the room, so I was so excited. Because she's 48, and the last thing I want to do is have to cut her femur down, the entire length of her femur. But she got this uh, spacer, and she's now on an antibiotic course, and hopefully we'll get her on to successful reimplantation. But when it comes to hip stems, I think you want to think about the major classes. Obviously, we talked about those fully HA-coated stems, like the cry. That's one sort of class in and of itself. We also have these modular neck stems seen here. These are primary stems. The modularity, these have been a bit of a disaster for us in orthopedics, and hopefully we're not seeing these things implanted much right now. But you'll see them in place, and they're often needing to be revised for metallosis coming from this trunnion junction. Um, and these can be difficult to take out, and that's where that Shukla modular set can be helpful. Um, these can be somewhat of a taper or a wedge taper type stem, it can be more fit and fill, it can even have Karai uh, box type patterns to them, so they all can be somewhat variable in how they come out. This is the ML wedge type stem. Um, this is designed to fit on a wedge from the medial to the lateral interface, so you actually wedge this out to the cortex um, and get it in there tight, but from the anterior to posterior um, uh, 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 size, it's, it's rather narrow. And so these usually you can work around them with long osteotomes in the front and back of the stem, work around the lateral shoulder and the medial calcar with these curved osteotomes. And the Shuka osteotomes that are coming down the pipe are going to be great. I've looked at them, haven't had the chance to use them yet in surgery, but hopefully will soon. Uh, but we've played with them in the lab, and they're really nice osteotomes. They provide a lot of, of great options for short calcar osteotomes with some longer options as well as shoulder osteotomes. And so those, those osteotomes are going to come in play because you can break up the, the bony interface here at this um, porous coating in the metaphyseal region and then hook on with the C-frame and hopefully get this stem out without needing an osteotomy. This is a fit and fill type stem, which, which involves both an ML type fit as well as an AP fit, where it's, it's um, kind of got a, a tapering geometry on the A to P cross section as well. Um, and these stems usually grow in a little bit more vigorously than do the ML stems, as well as the fact that they're a little bit more difficult to work around with osteotomes because they fill up the proximal femur. Uh, uh, all the companies have some sort of variety of this stem, and you'll find some people are big believers in it. They really work well. They can drill in well and have good stability, but they also tend to be tough to get out and take a fair bit of bone and trying to get them out. So it's nice to know if you've got one of these um, uh, and, and that it's maybe a little bit more of a challenge. And sometimes it's a little difficult to tell based on an AP the difference between these but usually you can tell as this is a little longer, straighter, with more of a bullet tip than, than these ML stems. These fully porous coated stems, 
these were the workhorse or the gold standard in revision settings um, until we got these uh, uh, modular Wagner style stems. But these, this is the the Depew AML stem that was the uh, uh, you know the, the the real mainstay or, or gold standard revision stem. These things grow in like crazy. They're cobalt chrome stems. They're fully porous coated, and they usually grow on the entirety of the length of this thing. Um, they're very, very hard to get out if you have to get them out. Usually what it entails is an ETO down to about the length of the stem. Usually you then have to cut the stem in situ with a metal cutting burr, and then you have to come down over the top of the thing with a trefine that basically is like a hole saw that you go around the end of the stem until you basically break up all the interface and you can get the thing out. Um, very rarely can you just hook onto this with a shoe claw and knock it out. And so if you've got a fully forest coated stem in place, um, there ought to be some block time for a fair bit of work to get it out. So now we'll move on to the V revision setting and then leave some room for questions at the end and hopefully I'll try not to drag on too long. And so when we come to knee revision, again, we wanna know what are the major reasons for knee revision? Um, these are kind of broken into early and late uh, causes of failure, but if you see in knees, infection really tr um, trumps most other causes for, for uh, 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 revision. And, and infection in the early setting is really what drives most of our revision. Instability and malalignment um, can uh, be the other major players. Loosening, not so much, um, unless we're dealing with certain implants that have a, a poor track record. Um, uh, but nowadays, it's, it seems to be infection and instability. Um, there are there were some evidence or some uh, uh, issues with uh, early loosening in the cementless realm. Uh, we're starting to re-enter a realm of, of cementless knee fixation, and so we'll see how that goes. Um, but uh, infection is still our major uh, driver, and with infection, it usually comes well-fixed cemented parts that are tough to get out. So again, the need for shoe closed equipment. Um, late failures, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, we'll see wear and associated osteolysis. Um, and then obviously infection is still playing a major role. Um, if we look at this paper, um, uh, looking at early uh, failures in total knee arthroplasty, again, major, play, major causes of infection and instability, both of which are gonna require good uh, instruments to get the parts out. Um, if we look at risk factors um, in the first 12 months uh, for failure, we've got all these medical risk factors. Obesity uh, does play a significant role uh, in the in the need for um, uh, revision early, and it's usually secondary to uh, an increased risk of infection. If you look at the rest of these, um, many of them, such as alcohol and drug abuse, renal disease, um, uh, are associated with higher rates of infection, and even depression has been shown that way. And chronic pulmonary disease and hemiplegia, um, uh, you know, for for other reasons. And so, as we prepare for revision total knee, since infection is a major cause. I always, you have to rule out infection. If you're ever going into a case with a surgeon that hasn't ruled that out, um, you know, a little prompting from your part um, uh, ought to be given. Uh, we, you've got to make sure that the joints are not infected. The worst thing you can do is go in and revise the knee and put in parts into an infected bed and the patient just gets reinfected. Um, and then pain for me is not an indication for revision. There's about 15 to 20% of knee replacements if you look at certain series that, uh, um, you know, where patients are unsatisfied and revising those patients that have well fixed parts that are uh, well aligned and well placed um, uh, leads to about 20% chance of success. So for me, pain is not an indication for revision. You have to have an objective reason to revise. Intraoperatively, we're talking about knee revision. It's a three step process. Exposure, which can be a bear, because sometimes these are socked in with a bunch of scar. Uh, in the infection setting, you have to do a huge synovectomy to get rid of the infected syno uh, synovium. Implant removal is the second um, step, and it's a major step in the game, and you have to do this carefully. And then obviously step three is joint reconstruction. I think a lot of people focus only on step three and thinking about how they're gonna reconstruct the joint. They don't put enough time in steps one and two and unfortunately, steps one and two can massively jeopardize step three. And so the implant removal process has gotta be safe, expedient, and you gotta preserve bone. And I think that's where um, the, the equipment that uh, um, is provided with the shuko knee extractions that can be quite helpful. Um, and uh, you need to respect the extensor mechanism. And the sequence removal for me is to take the poly out and then focus on the femoral component then remove the tubal component, and at last I'll leave, uh, I'll revise the patella, and usually I do that at the end of the case after I have all new parts in, so I don't 
uh, mess with the patellar bone and have it fracture on me while I'm doing the rest of the case. When it comes to the knee extraction set, this is the set. And for me, the major players are these Z osteotomes. These things are absolutely game changing. Um, and these things are great. I used to use an Intimate osteotome, which was shaped like this. Um, it was the only one I could find like it. I got it from my fellowship and uh, really, really uh, enjoyed that osteotome. But um, usually it was bent or broken uh, or in the shop getting sharpened. And so when the Shukla that came out and, and these things were included. Um, it was just uh, it was just awesome. These are super useful, both on the femoral and tibial side. Um, and then for me, I use uh, both the tibial and femoral extractors, um, and I think they both are helpful. And I'll talk about that. I don't really use these back cutting osteotomes except for on rare occasion, and then obviously the C frame and the and the and the big mallet. Um, so you know when we're using the osteotome. On the tibial side, I think the Z osteotome can be helpful to work around the front. For me, the Z osteotome also works around the back of the implant. I just get enough exposure that I can come in from the sides and work underneath these posterior um, uh, portions of the tibial tray. The posterior lateral corner of the tibial tray is usually where you have the hardest time getting exposure, and that's usually where we still leave bone. But you can still use that Z osteotome by coming in from the medial side, getting around the posterior tray here, and working under this area with the Z osteotome. Um, usually you can do that um, adequately with just this osteotome and not have to get in this, this big back cutting or reverse osteotome. This osteotome can be helpful, but it's just, it's rather hard to get it all the way in and then to hit back at yourself and feel like you're doing uh, much good. And so I think the Z is just a, a much more useful osteotome. Usually you're using it here already, and then you can just start working around the back with it. And so I use it all the way around the tibia as well as a reciprocating saw to work the in, in, entire interface. And usually that doesn't take very long and it's pretty easy. Uh, I use the Z osteotome on the femoral side um, to get around the posterior condyle of the femur. So this is kind of a close up of a femoral component. And so I use it around these posterior condyles and around the, uh, the uh, posterior chamfers of the component. Um, and then I use the femoral uh, extractor where a lot of people will just take a goat's foot and start hitting on the femoral component. I feel like when you do that, you tend to rock the component, either rock it anteriorly or rock it medially and laterally, and then that can lead to you um, kind of uh, gouging bone out posteriorly or gouging it out on the opposite side of where you're hitting rather than pulling the component off. You're trying to hit it off and you're rolling it off, where I'd rather pull it straight in line with the component, and that's where this extractor, once it's hooked up, you can hook it up to the C-frame and hit right in line with the component and pull the component straight up without losing much more bone. It's important to note that these extractors are made to go around the femoral component like this and not into the little grooves on the side. Those little grooves are made for the impactors for the component. Each of the companies has their own specific impactor, and they just seem to fit for these things, but the reality is the teeth on this femoral extractor, if you try to stick them in the grooves on the side of the femoral component, they only stick in about a millimeter or two, and then you start hitting on it, and this metal just starts to fatigue, and will eventually break, and then you're, you know, you're set in the shop. So it's, it's much better to work under this interface with an osteotome, get this, uh, get this impactor to go underneath the component, and then hit it off with the C-frame. The tibial extractor is, is fairly straightforward. And again, it follows the same principles, and it has to go underneath the component. You usually put it under after you've uh, worked under the interface. Um, I think the tibial component extractor is really great. One thing to note is got to have good enough exposure. You got to make sure that that posterior um, or the, the uh, lateral femur rather is, uh, is exposed adequately enough and is out of the way of this tibial tray. Because once you start hitting this, uh, the uh, tibial tray off, you can blow off part of the lateral femoral condyle if you're not paying attention. So here's some knee case examples. This 76-year-old gentleman, he came um, uh, to, to me, unfortunately, through the oncology ward. He was uh, had a total knee back in 2010 that was well-functioning um, and, and was working well for him, but unfortunately, he had leukemia. So he was on our oncology ward on chemotherapy for that, and uh, while he was immunosuppressed on therapy, unfortunately, his left knee became infected, and they consulted us, and he went and saw him and found him to be infected. And so here, you can see he's got a well-fixed um, total knee. This is a cementless striker triathlon total knee. Um, it's an older version of, of this uh, tibial tray, but nonetheless, it's cementless. Um, there's no cement at the interface. 
And this appears to be well fixed. I don't see any significant rate of lucency. I don't see that this thing has been wobbling around at all. And the interface here appears pretty tight as well as it does in the patella. And sometimes we think that cementless components are going to be more of a challenge to get off. And I think that they're actually easier to get off with less bone loss. But you have to be patient to work all of these interfaces, again, with your osteotomes or saws before you start hitting things with the shukla. Because if you hit it with the extractors before you're taking it off, you're going to be taking on with it. And so here was his case. We took him back and did a spacer in him. This is uh, my iteration of a spacer, um, and it's my own iteration. And so it's, it's a, another long talk on uh, why I do what I do here. But nonetheless, it's a metal on plastic spacer with a lot of antibiotic cement and cement-laden dowels uh, in, in both of the canals. And so this is a well-placed spacer. It was actually um, because we are able to get things off without any significant bone loss, much more like a primary uh, knee for him. Um, but he knew that this was a spacer and wanted this revised. And so after his infection had been eradicated, we took him back for revision. And unfortunately, um, I got a little wild with the shukla and thought that, well, this is a spacer. I usually cement it rather poorly when the knee is rather bloody. But we had pretty good cement digitation with this cement. And I probably had cemented it a little too early. And with the power of the shukla, we knocked off the femoral component and pulled off all of the central bone. And we're left with just two little wafers of condyle. The fact that his um, his uh, uh, medial femoral condyle started to break off it was so thin, and I had to support it with some K wire while I did the rest of the case. And this required a huge femoral uh, cone to reconstruct this, and a lot more time um, and swear words in the OR. And so, if I would have taken the time uh, to just work those interfaces better, um, uh, it would have been a, a much easier day. But it, it just I think it just uh, lends discussion to the fact that the, the uh, the shukla is a powerful device and you really need to tell your surgeons like hey you probably want to work the interface as well because this puts a lot more force into getting parts off and you can take parts with a lot of bone if you're not careful uh, but uh, luckily as you can see he went on to successful revision he's done really well and um, and been doing well now for several years so this is a second case example a 57 year old gentleman again coming in with infection you can see the recurring theme that infection is probably the major player in the knee space for revision um, but he had a total knee in 2013 had infection with an ind that then got reinfected he then had this two-stage revision with these sleeved um, uh, revision parts and uh, um, unfortunately uh, became reinfected with that you can see he's got a huge um, uh, amount of fluid in this knee he came in with a draining sinus and uh, um, it was uh, worked up in my clinic and found to be infected. And so, you know, we're faced with, with now this 57-year-old with all these surgeries and now what looked to be well-fixed sleeves on his femoral side, the tibial side looked a little loose, but the femur looked like it was gonna be a bear. And what these are, these, these are these sleeves, they're integrated to the component, but they're a fully porous metal that usually gets, you know, wedged into the metaphysis. And these grow in using the full length of this porous metal and lead to great fixation, but really uh, long days in the OR when they need to come out. On the tibial side, luckily, in this implant itself, most of the porosity is right in here, and this one had been cemented where all the porosity was, and so nothing grew on the tibia, and the tibia was actually loose um, due to the infection and was easy to come out, but this femur was grown in well. And so, you know, um, I could have hooked up a shukla and just started whacking, but probably what it would have done is dissociate this Morse taper between the stem and the sleeve, and I would have been left with then just a well fixed stem and sleeve in the canal and still been scratching my head with uh, how to get it out. Uh, and so we had to get creative as you often do in the OR. And so what we did is we took a metal cutting bar and cut the anterior um, uh, aspect of this, this anterior flange of the femoral component off so I could have access to the underlying bone. I took the pencil tip burr and then cut a piece of the anterior cortex of femur off in the shape of this cone. And then we took a pencil tip burr and worked the interface along the uh, medial and lateral sides of this sleeve. And so then we're left with a sleeve that's just grown in on the posterior aspect and the stem that's left. And that's when I hooked up with the shoot gun and started hitting. We were able to pull the component out without any significant bone loss, surprisingly, and then just lay that piece of cortex back on and then build a spacer around it. And so he had this spacer and we treated his infection successfully and then took him on to revision and we came back at the time of revision luckily that bone had actually started to integrate it was well uh, starting to grow back in and we're able to just uh, now go back with cone fixation 
proximal to the tibia and femur. He had a lot of bone loss in his proximal tibia, so he rebuilt that with this uh, lobed cone. And um, he's had a, a successful result here. He's now a few years out. Um, he went on to later break his ankle because he was doing so much activity. And I now have a plate from here up to here. Thank God he didn't get reinfected. And so that's what I have right now um, for the, you know, um, basic, I guess the basics on, on hip and knee revision and, and where Shuka can come into play. And so I would just sort of open it up to, to questions. Um, and I think that's probably where we can um, maybe learn the most. Hey, there. Dr. Gillen, this is, there. yep, yep, this is Jamie, how are you? Good, how are you, man? I'm doing great, that was uh, really good. One of the things I didn't realize is how even during an ETO, uh, the Shukla extractor plays a big role in getting those hip stems out. Is that because there's still attachment down the internal side that you can't get to? What, what makes it so that it's still difficult even with the ETO? Yeah, so I mean that's a great question, Jamie. I don't. Let me see if I can um, easily advance slides back. But like, if you go back to that case and that's the reason why I put the Karai stem in there or that fully HA coated style stem, um, you know, in an if you have an ML taper type stem that you're having a hard time getting out and you have to do an ETO, usually you can do the ETO and get around the area where you've got most of the ingrowth. Um, but you know, stem that's fully on grows like the Karai stem. Well, forget going back. We've got so many slides there, but on a stem that fully engrows like the cry style stem, it's really hard to get all of those interfaces, even doing an osteotomy, unless you make your osteotomy the entirety of the length of the stem, which, you know, I, I'm usually trying not to, to take out the whole proximal third of the femur and really would take out maybe the proximal half of that stem. And so you still have some interface where you're struggling to get, you know, to get broken up with the osteotome or a jiggly saw or something. And the reality is, there we go, thanks, um, is that, you know, there's some area that's still on grown. And so you'll, you know, you'll try to hook up to that with a standard, you know, one of these rinky-dink um, extractors, and uh, it doesn't it doesn't help. And so, you know, the Shukla is still quite a powerful device where, you know, you've done this osteotomy, but, but yet, you know, this portion of the stem still has some ingrowth in it, and you try to hook up to it and it doesn't hit out, well, that's where you can really still hook up to the Shukla. And, and even on this guy, we worked these, you know, these interfaces quite extensively, and you just had this much of the stem down there, but these stems just grow on so aggressively. You need the power of the Shukla. Yeah, from a sales standpoint, I mean, that's huge, because I focus a lot of reduction of osteotomy with our capabilities, but right. it's it's going to be advantageous for me to add even to say, hey, doc, even if you have to do an ETO, you're still struggling to get that stem out, and that's where we can play a role as well. So that's very good information. I never really focused in on that in sales prior. Yeah, and I, you know, I was telling this to Nitin earlier. So, I mean, you know, even if you get guys in by saying, yeah, we can reduce osteoarthritis, which I think is, is the case, you can for sure, um, because you can just put a little bit more power into taking the thing out. Uh, once you get people, you know, kind of sold on that you get just so used to the ease of hooking this extractor up to a stem and having the power of the c-frame it's just like you don't want to screw around with any of the other extraction tools like the animed one or the or the ones that come with the sets because they're just they're they're just rinky dink compared to this you know and so you, yeah you get so used to having it that you want it for everything and i still have it in the room and if I do an ETO I can still hook up to it with this and still use the Shukla to get it out. Yeah, no, it's good information today. I mean, I've been doing this every day for many years and I learned quite a few things during your talk today, so I appreciate it. Oh, I'm glad. glad. That was an excellent talk, Dr. Gillen. Again, I want to thank Dr. Gillen for his time. He spent obviously a lot of time customizing the presentation for us. Um, and, and making it such that we can all understand and learn from it, even if we've been in the field, as Jamie said, for years at this point. Um, is at this point, does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Gilman? Please to take advantage of it and ask them now. And I can see a question on here that says, was this recorded for future use? And, and Mitten's been recording this, and so I think that's going to be the point of this, is to, to have it available. And so I'll leave that up to him. 
Yeah, definitely, Dr. Gill, and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll send you a media consent form, and we'll put this up on YouTube if that's okay with you, and use it for educational purposes for our reps, our, our self force, obviously our internal folks, and anyone that would like to use super medical for future needs. Sure. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. Thank Great. you very so much. Thank you again, Dr. Gillen. Thanks, everyone, for joining in. Really, really appreciate your time.